What's up guys, Damien Keys here, welcome back. We are still in Small Pond Studios and I still have the guys. I've got Andy and I've got Chris. Uh, today we are talking about playing live gigs quietly. So over the last 20 years of my life, I have done my fair share of gigs while someone is either staring at me, shouting at me, or there's a limiter in, in the back of the room about to cut all electricity from the band should we play too loudly. I'm sure many of you have been in that situation. So what do you do? Those limiters are an absolute <laughs> But at the same point, you have to get through the gig. The show must go on, so what do you do? Well, over the years of playing hundreds of these sort of venues, I have come up with my fair share of tips. I'm sure you've got some too. So today, we are gonna go through every tip I can think of to help you get through a limiter gig, or if, even if there's not a limiter gig and you just have to play quietly for whatever reason, that's what we're gonna work on today. So for the purpose today, we just thought, what song can we play? We just thought, how about some good old fashioned ACDC? Why not? So we're gonna play some ACDC back in black, um, but the purpose is, how we can start to take the, the decibel limiter down, especially on certain frequencies which will set off these limiters. Now the thing about limiters is there's so many different versions. Sometimes you will turn up to a, a venue and there'll be a green light system, which effectively says you're in the green for a while, you're in the amber, and as soon as that goes in the red, it's danger. And then sometimes you have a certain amount of time before it cuts off. Sometimes as soon as you hit that red, it cuts off. But either way, you know something bad is gonna happen when you start hitting that red on a kind of regular basis. So it's the type of gig where everyone is not focused on the audience and nobody is focused on each other. Everyone is focused on a panel on the wall telling you to play quieter. It's a really difficult gig. But the amount of times that you'll turn up to the impossible limiter, as we call it, where you're just thinking, how have bands do this? And the venue always say the same thing. They always go, well, everyone else can manage it. And you just think, well, I've done hundreds of these and I feel like I'm pretty good at this. So if we can't manage it, it must be pretty tough. Now the hard work is done in the sound check. If you can get it right in the sound check, you're probably gonna set yourself up for a much easier ride going forward. So the very first tip is when you sound check, make sure that limiter is on. Because the last thing you wanna do is go through a sound check, get through the gig and just think, ah, I thought it was easy, but it isn't easy. And you're getting cut off every few minutes. Now the thing with these limiters is you never know where they're gonna be. They may be attached to the wall at the back of the venue and the venue might be really big, might be a nice easy night, or they might be literally above your head, ready to cut you off at any, any moment. So the sound check is absolutely crucial, but the sound check doesn't tell the full story because once you've done your sound check, usually to an empty room, then you start bringing in 100, 200 drunk people who are very rowdy, and you realize that in your sound check you were incredibly quiet, or even that the, the sound of the people shouting could potentially even set the limiter off. So the first thing we're gonna do once we've set everything up is we're gonna go straight to the obvious point, the drums. Now, if we can control the drums, we can control everything else building up in a jigsaw. If we can't control the drums, then all we're doing is adding more and more frequency into a very, very difficult scenario. So, so we've got Andy. Andy is very capable of playing limiters uh, over the last 10 years, probably done a thousand gigs and probably 20% of them will be to limiters. So it's a kind of regular occurrence and you never know what the room sounds like because it could be glass, it could be stone, it could be like a studio where it's nice and easy, but you're always fighting the certain frequencies. So what we've got to do is we have to get Andy's levels down before we can start building the melodic content on top of it. So Andy has done so many of these gigs. He has a lot of experience. So from the horse's mouth, Andy, um, when you turn up to this gig and you've set everything up, what is the one piece of advice that you are giving to drummers in this in this situation? Well, I mean, other than the obvious of getting the levels down, which we'll talk about in a bit, um, I think it's just awareness of the limiter itself. As a three-piece band, these guys are mostly engaging with the audience and they've got other things to think about. Obviously, they're, they're trying as well, but I see it as mostly my responsibility to just keep an eye on it, really, and um, just to make it easier for, for the all-round experience. Yeah, one thing I notice as well is sometimes you are paying attention to three or four th things at once, and all of a sudden the drums really drop out. And at that moment, you look at the limiter, you notice it's hitting the red. It's because Andy's seen it, and he's overcompensating, taking the drums out to make sure that we don't just all go over a cliff as it is. Yeah, and I mean, sonically, sometimes that can sound 
a little bit ridiculous, I guess, but sometimes you just got to do what you've got to do. And I think people think they're always going to be unfun, but we've had loads of limited gigs that are, that are great, aren't they? Yeah, really good. Um, and obviously because some of them are based on an average as well, so as, if you start getting used to that, you can use dynamics and say, well, I know I can do a really great fill here, but for this long, because <laughs> you know, you know that it's not going to cut you off at that moment. So yeah, it's just experience and, but yeah, mainly keeping our, an eye on it, really. Right, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to concentrate on the drums because, again, we need to get those, those frequencies and the level down of the drums. Uh, and anything that we can do to make it easier for everyone else is, is key. So the way we do that is, obviously, most drummers, we're going to start off with some sticks, some big heavy sticks. But as soon as you see a limiter, you're probably going to be switching to these kind of plastic rods. You can see these have had some these have had some action for some limiter gigs, which I like. But you'll notice the difference not just in the noise levels, but the noise frequencies as well. Right. So shall we just try back in black with sticks and then back in black with rods? Great, and the same thing again with the rods. Good. Now notice that the frequencies are totally different. Now this isn't just for limiter gigs. This isn't just for setting off limiters. I mean, we've done gigs in living rooms. All of a sudden, you can't play at stadium level when you're in a living room, not only because of the neighborhood, but also because the people in front of you are going to be terrified. It's going to be too much for people without any earplugs. So this is about playing quietly in general, but keeping the energy. Now, um, the good thing with these things is, you can put a lot of energy in. Uh, so yeah, like Demo was just saying, I mean, sometimes I use these even when there isn't a limiter, in fact, quite often, uh, just because it's just more vibey. I can play as if I'm playing with sticks, but with these and just the frequencies are a lot more kind of controlled. If it's this, it's better than doing this. <laughs> it just feels better, so yeah. Okay, but what happens when you've got your plastic rods and they are still too loud? Is there anything else that we can do to start bringing the frequencies down? Absolutely, of course there is. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to look at our trusty musician's friend, the gaffer tape. So one of the parts of the drum kit that's most kind of reactive in like these massive kind of halls that you play for weddings and stuff like that is the snare drum. Um, it's not going to set off a limiter, but it's going to sound ridiculous in the context of a a band that are trying to play to a limiter so often just um, scrunching up some gaffer tape like that initially and then using another bit to kind of dampen that down if we do that all the way around the drum that's going to kill it quite a lot but yeah it's, it might sound like you know a stevie wonder record or something so that's quite cool so, so it still sounds kind of cool but you don't get that crazy kind of ring So the next thing we notice is now that we've dampened the snare drum down, that's great, but toms are usually fine. They don't usually ring out over everything else, but the other things obviously is the hi-hat and obviously the cymbals. So the whole purpose of the cymbals is to add that crashing energy. As soon as you're going out of a verse into a chorus, you're giving it a big boost of energy, um, which we've got to be careful of. So now we want to keep the energy, but we don't want to set off the limiter or we don't want to kill anyone who's two foot in front of us. So what can we do with the cymbals do we do the same thing as we do with the snare? So you probably noticed from that example now that this is really tight and these are kind of pretty overwhelming in the mix now compared to the level of the whole kit. Um, you can get sim pads, which are kind of like giant cymbal felts. Um, they're really effective, 
but probably not effective enough still for a lot of the gigs we do. Okay, this might not be pretty, and I know a lot of people are very into their symbols, but um, you just do whatever you've got to do really to get through. And this, um, you, can, you know, you still get the, um, the feel of hitting a real symbol, because other options are like electric kits and stuff like this. I much prefer this. Just a bit of gaffer tape all the way around the edge here, and yeah, if, if you find it's too dead, you can just take a couple off. It's pretty, pretty simple. So compared to, oh. so, you know, it's not going to win any awards for for how a symbol sounds, but sometimes you've got to do what you got to do. So this is great, we're bringing all these frequencies down, but what happens when we have to go to DEF CON 5? What happens when it's emergency situation and we need it to be as quiet as humanly possible? Well, two things, it's, it's cloth, it's material. I know it sounds crazy, but material soaks up as much sound as possible. So one of the things you do is you go around everyone in the band and anyone you can find material from, extra jumpers, extra jackets, extra coats, and you start putting it into the bass drum. You pack that bass drum so tight, so instead of getting a boom, you get a but what it means is that limiter isn't gonna go off. So with that in mind, the other thing you can do is get your trusty tea towel. Every venue is gonna have a tea towel and this is last ditch case scenario to stop that limiter going off. All of a sudden, you hand it to your drummer and you say, it's going over your snare drum. It's gonna sound horrific, but again, this is all about getting through a gig. Now I've only had to do this a couple of times, but every so often, this is a winning trick to get you through that gig. Yeah, back in black. Great. Drums are down, let's start working on the bass. Okay, so this was my setup for many, many years. Old school, 70s P bass, as heavy as I can possibly get it. Then I've got my Ampeg SVT into an eight by 10. Obviously this setup, when you're playing in a rock band and you are playing on festivals or you're playing big stages, I just don't think it gets better. I think this is about as good as it gets. I've now switched from Ampeg to Orange. I love my Orange AD200, I think it's the best it can get, but it's a big, fat valve amp. Same thing with this, big fat valve amp. The problem with this and limiters is they do not go together well. Neither does this bass. So when it comes to bass frequencies, if I know there's going to be a limiter or if I have to actually get away with playing quieter, then it's the gear for me that changes. Okay, so I've swapped from my P bass to my jazz bass. Now, a jazz bass is usually a slightly thinner, tighter sound. And it means also with the pickup selection, I can probably put my thumb at the back. So I'm getting much a much tighter, more middly honky sound, which was, is gonna be perfect for any kind of limiter gig, especially because the bass is the one thing that's guaranteed to set off a limiter. So I've got, I mean, I'm quite lucky in a way, I've got quite a few guitars, but you really notice the difference in frequencies. For example, I have two P basses. My black P bass is the, the weightiest, heaviest bass, which is full of low end. Whereas I also have quite a light uh, 76 P bass, which is so clanky because it's so, so light, physically light with the wood. Same thing with this jazz. This jazz has got a very thick neck, so you get a lot more wood, uh, woody bass out of it. Whereas I do have another jazz uh, with a much thinner neck. Again, makes it much easier for playing quieter. But then what happens if these don't work? These are passive basses. So then I've got this. This is a music man. This is an active bass. In fact, it's very active. This could literally melt the fillings out of your head. But what it means is I have control. So on both of these basses, on a passive bass, everything is turned up. Everything is turned up, going into a valve amp, and I'm just playing. Whereas with this, I have a lot more control. The EQ is active, so I can start to roll off bass as much as I want to. So 
So that's bases sorted, but what about amps? Now, obviously, this is not the most ideal base amp for a limiter. Usually, I have a, a slightly smaller four-speakered um, Ampeg SVT with my orange head. I can roll all the bass off, but the problem isn't that. I can get away with the gig, it's just so unfun to play. So at that point, I would rather not be playing through a valve amp and I'd probably rather go through solid state. Now in, in the van or, or in, in my house, I tend to keep a solid state amp. I haven't brought it because I don't want to embarrass any manufacturers that I would class this as my last minute amp because that would be unfair. But effectively, my solid state amp is very, very simple, a couple of hundred quid, a couple of hundred watts, and it allows me in, in very quiet circumstances, a lot more range with my bass amps, uh, with my bass sound. So effectively, great for big gigs, terrible for small gigs. What I would tend to do is I would tend to look at something a little bit more solid statey. I mean, for me, it's just a very small head which lives in a van so that if we get there and it's going to be a disaster, it just comes out and goes on the normal speaker. Other than bass and amp, I don't really use much in the way of pedals. I have a tuner on my pedal board and I also have a, a like an octave pedal so I can, I can boost a bit of the low end. And that's pretty much it. But I do have um, an EQ pedal for this exact reason. Now, to be able to start taking out certain frequencies that you know are going to fit in with that limiter is really, really crucial, or just that's going to fit in with the vocals. Don't forget, one of the biggest things we are doing right now is we are making space for the vocals. We're taking everything down to allow the vocals to be as loud as they can be before they are offensive in whatever way that is. Uh, and this, just a little EQ pedal, means that I can start to fiddle with the sound and the gig isn't going to be horrifically unfun to play because instead of taking all the volume down, I'm just taking out frequencies. Okay, so that's the rhythm section, but obviously there's a multitude of different instruments that could be within your band, but obviously guitar and vocals are a big one. Now, again, vocals is the key. We need to be able to hear the vocals for this to be a good gig. And ironically enough, guitars don't traditionally set off limiters. So your main job as a guitarist is effectively not being too loud. Whereas obviously bass and drums have to massively come down. If, if the guitar's too loud, it pushes the vocal level up in order to be audible and the vocal the vocal level 100% will knock that limiter off. So Chris has done a million of these gigs as well. And so he's got his own little tips um, from amps and, and, and pedals that he uses. But what would you say from, from a guitarist, your responsibility and, and, and how you approach the gig, what sort of advice would you give? So I mean, with regards to limiters, obviously the guitar on its own is not gonna set a limiter off, but you kind of need to be aware that you're not adding to the overall sound. Because yes, the guitar on its own might not set the limiter off, but if everything's too loud and it's and it's just about okay, and your guitar pushes it over the edge, that's kind of not cool and you're sort of defeating the point. What you can do is you can take the mids out because that gives a lot more space for the, for the vocals. Um, that's kind of good etiquette anyway, really, mm -hmm. whether you're playing to a limiter or not. But you back off on the mids, that's where a lot of the volume is. It gives space for the vocals. The vocals can come down and, and be sort of more sitting in with everything else. Um, that's a key part. Um, also, with regards to gear, I mean, the guitar itself, it doesn't have as much of an effect as the, maybe the bass does. Um, but with the amp, 95% of amps have got master volume, so you can just back off on that if you need to. So that's not a problem. Typically, the, the one I use doesn't. Um, so sometimes if there's a really quiet limiter gig, I will just set up a, a sort of drive sound that I'm happy with using a pedal and just use that volume, just back the volume down on the drive pedal and just accept that that is my amp sound for today. This, this is such an important tool to have because so many venues have limiters and I can promise you there are a lot more venues on the way. Venues are getting shut down because of noise complaints. More and more humans are happening. More and more humans are moving places and therefore it means that we're going to get more venues needing limiters because of the built up areas that they are surrounded in. So therefore, we have to, as musicians, we have to be good at playing quietly. We have to be good at keeping the energy, keeping the excitement, but also keeping the level down. So a couple of tips is always make sure that you're setting up 
your sound check for that limiter itself or for that gig. Number two is making sure your eyes are everywhere. No matter who you are in the band, you're constantly watching that limiter and you're constantly watching everybody else in order to pull it back where needs needs be. One person dropping out for a couple of seconds is better than the whole thing going off, including the lights. And you've got that embarrassing thing where someone has to walk over to it and press the reset button and come back and start again whilst the crowd are watching you just not knowing what's going on. And the last piece of advice, and probably most importantly, is look after the venue because the venue will get it in the neck every single week. They'll constantly be getting bands and musicians going, oh, this is shit, this is rubbish. And so if you can actually work with them and say, look, we're doing everything we can, you can see our drum kit, you can see what we've got from, from extra gear that we bring in, you are doing your part. Make it look like you're doing your part and allow them to help you. Sometimes they might turn the limiter off, sometimes they might turn a blind eye if it's a handheld limiter, but on the whole, your venue owner, your venue manager, weirdly enough, is your best friend in this scenario. Great, so do me a favor, guys, if you can like, subscribe, more importantly, come and be a part of this community because we're doing this all the time. We've got some big videos coming up, but thank you so much for watching. Thank you to Chris, thank you to Andy. Uh, I think we should do these things more often. I'm quite enjoying doing stuff from the studio. So if you've got any ideas for, for, for videos you'd like to see from the rehearsal room, from the studio, or even from a live gig, then let me know. I'm up for making some new style of videos. So uh, thanks for watching, see you guys tomorrow.